on here on this cloudy Sunday. I think um, the fact that you are on here, that you chose to, to uh, invest your Sunday to be part of this first event, shows that you share our sense of urgency to approach digitalization of our, diff uh, of our everyday life from a different, from many angles. <laughs> My name is Andrea Bauer. This is Boris Moschkowitz. We are the initiator of D-Day. And um, as most of you know, Boris and I work um, or are spending our professional lives in the technology and media industry for quite a while. We're dedicated to drive digital strategies and businesses forward. But we felt that there, uh, we missed something around the discourse of digitalization. Especially in a post Snowden world, we think we need to look more into the profound impact of the digital revolution into our very fabric of society. And this is why we invited every one of you from all these better, different backgrounds to be part of this special setting, exclusive setting, to foster this discourse. And today, we talk about mass surveillance, digital mass surveillance. And why did we chose this title, uh, Changing Narrative from Hacking to Storytelling? Because we think that with the disclosures of Edward Snowden, it is um, important that, um, that the understanding of, our, of the nature of the internet is crucial to everyone. And how do we reach everyone? For this, we need new stories, new narratives. Narratives that show us the real nature of surveillance and its effects on us, on our social interactions. And for this we invited today two key figures, two key protagonists to um, share with us their insights and experience within a panel discussion and a subsequent Q&A. To introduce them I would love to hand over to Boris. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm sure many of you have heard Angela Richter and um, Jacob Applebaum before. To us, they're the perfect match to illustrate what we call from hacking to storytelling. Both of them have had first-hand experiences with two of the most wanted, as well as two of the most secluded men of our times, Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. They're here to share their stories. Angela is a playwright, theater director, and activist. And the last year, she's been focusing on mass surveillance and transparency. Her ongoing interviews with um, the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, have led to the work Assassinate Assange. She examines the various aspects of uh, Julian's persona, um, the shift in the public perception, and um, in the second part of the series, Assassinate Assange Reloaded, Jacob Applebaum has been performing alongside her. Jacob has been shifting his role in the public from being a hacker and developer of the anonymization network Tor to being a prominent voice in the media. Jake is one of the few people who have entire access to all of Edward Snowden's files. And together with filmmaker and activist Laura Poitras, he's researching these materials and publishing insightful stories on their Spiegel. Yet the collaboration between Jacob and Angela marks a cultural shift in raising awareness for the growing loss of uh, privacy. So let's look at the start, sort of storytelling uh, while um, I want to present you a brief trailer. It's not just a play, it's what I call an immersive experience.
sun Faces look ugly when you're alone Women seem wicked when you are wanted Streets are uneven when you're down When you're sun Faces come out of the rain Do you see yourself as a part of the culture in the meantime? Thank you. Please welcome Angela Richter and uh, Jacob Applebaum to the stage. Thanks. Great for having you. Take a seat. There's microphones next to you. And let's get started right away with um, Angela. In this trailer, we saw, saw something. She's recording you, be aware. <laughs> and it's not really working, so okay. <laughs> Alright. That's right. In the trailer there, there was a phrase that uh, struck me. Die Zukunft gehört den Nerds. The future belongs to the nerds. Do you really believe that the hackers and the nerds are the new avant-garde? Well, uh, of course, this is a very provocative um, sentence, especially in the context of art and theatre where I come from, because we have a long tradition of being the avant-garde in a way that uh, art always could influence society. And I feel that, of course, it's a little bit a radical statement and also meant to be provocative a bit, but uh, I think it is true even more than I'd like it to be, maybe, as we see that um, the, the things that somebody like Julian Assange did, or Snowden, made a very fast paradigm shift. And uh, you cannot even watch as fast as, as things happen, you know. So I, I think, yes, I, I said that, it's nearly two years ago when I put that statement on stage, and at that point I couldn't even know what, what will happen in the meantime. So yes. Wow. So, and Jacob, I mean, you started out as a called hacker, hacktivist, uh, focusing on encrypting, but now you work with the Angelo Place, with the Laura on videos. Um, you um, published as a journalist in the Spiegel. Um, why did you choose those, let's say, more artistic ways to express yourself? Well, when dealing with topics of signals intelligence, uh, I, I really think that it's important to make sure that it's possible to continue to talk about these topics, and in some cases there are very serious legal consequences unless you're a special person. So to be a journalist allows you to talk about topics in the public interest where you may have some privileges you might otherwise not have. So my political voice as a programmer is silenced, actually, if I want to talk about some of the issues that we face, like the issues of mass surveillance, unless I'm a credentialed journalist. And I've worked with Spiegel for many years, actually, uh, probably 2010 was the first time I did serious work with uh, Marcel and Holger at Der Spiegel. And so I thought it was very important to be able to continue to do that, especially with some of the topics that Edward Snowden has released to the public. And I also thought that it was important to try to change the dialogue a lot. Um, for many years, people thought that myself and other people talking about mass surveillance, that we were just crazy people. Joke's on you. So, um, unfortunately, we weren't crazy enough, as it were. Um, and so, I think it's important to win the culture wars, so to, so to speak, or the culture conflicts that are happening right now. And to do that, you have to involve the art world. You have to write about these things. That you, you basically have to take every possible angle to introduce it into people's lives to make it relevant, so that they can begin to contextualize and understand what's actually happening in a way that's meaningful for them, so that they can express themselves. You uh, were you was you produced Oedipus at Salzburg Festspiele a long time ago, and I think this was the moment uh, when you realized that you are not very much interested in classical plays and more in in realistic plays. What kind of theater do you go for? Mm, yes. What's the role of theater today, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I became really bored and then I, I came to realize, okay, when I'm bored on my own rehearsals, 
what should I expect from the audience watching it? I mean, it's not that I don't like classical plays. I admire Shakespeare. I love to read it. But I just don't have the feel that I should put it on stage because I always have this feeling that I'm building a museum or something, you know? And uh, it became really boring for me and I thought, okay, what can uh, theatre do else, you know? And actually when I did that in Salzburg, at the same time I, um, I learned about Wikileaks and I find it a really, really uh, overwhelming idea to say, you know, that uh, you can uh, upload documents on a website. It was just very... Uh, uh, fantastic, I thought, and I, I was thinking, why? Why didn't uh, nobody else come up with it earlier? Because it seems so obvious. But uh, so I was very interested in the topic, and then at some point I decided uh, to only do research-based uh, plays. I did that before, also with um, there is a the forbidden uh, novel by Maxim Biller, Ezra, and I made a play about uh, the whole legal case and also about a little bit also about the. Uh, the Rose War between them, you know, around that, and, and th this and some other stuff also which was based on, on research, so it was just a small step because I was very interested in the Wikileaks topic, and so yeah, it was kind of logical to do it. Yeah, I see, I see. Jacob, you just mentioned also that you, of course, you're working with the Spiegel. What's the role of mass uh, media, like the press right now, on, on mass surveillance? Did they fail? Well, I mean, I think it depends. I mean, there are many different media outlets around the world. Right now, Germany is the most free place that we can publish about the NSA's surveillance. I, I cannot work as a journalist in the United States. In the United Kingdom, there's a terrorism case as well as an Official Secrets Act case where people like Sarah Harrison cannot return to the United Kingdom as a result of those cases, and certainly not to continue to work and to publish about these, uh, these revelations. So, I mean, did the mass media fail? No, I think actually society is failing the media and the free press and the promise to a free press. And in Germany right now, I think it's one of the better places to work on these issues, but it kind of makes sense that it would be because these issues have almost nothing to do with, let's say, Angela Merkel's mistakes. So it's almost always the case that you're more free to criticize something from a different system when you're existing in a different framework almost entirely. I mean, there are some exceptions. For example, Germany is particularly victimized. Um, I revealed, for example, the Merkel uh, scandal, where Merkel was being spied on by the NSA. That was my story that I brought to Der Spiegel. And um, that would not have been possible in the United States. But that's not a failure of the media. That is a failure of the US government in controlling its spy apparatus. And its protection of the press is just abysmal. And how is the awareness in the US, for instance, on the, on, on the press? If you compare it, you know, the German and the U.S. press, for instance. Well, so the U.S. is, in theory, a very free country, and I, you know, I, I grew up in the United States, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of things that I experienced when I was there. Um, but I also think nationalism is a sickness, and I think that the U.S. is uh, seriously ill with nationalism. And we have a theoretical freedom of the press where the press won't be regulated, but we're talking about, um, for example, people like Glenn Greenwald, in the public sphere talking about um, the, the Attorney General being questioned directly if he will be prosecuted for writing about Edward Snowden. And the Attorney General essentially sidesteps this. I mean, it's clear on paper that Glenn Greenwald is not a criminal. He is a journalist who is telling us things in the public interest. And the Attorney General, when directly confronted, could not say that. And he even said that people that were advocating for Edward Snowden, which is also protected under the First Amendment, that those people would be treated differently than legitimate journalists, which is to say that people like Julian Assange, myself, Laura Poitras, Glenn Greenwald, well, there's some question if we're legitimate journalists, and obviously if we should dare to advocate that we think Edward Snowden is a whistleblower, then we will be dealt with in a more harsh manner. And so, in a sense, the theory of the free press, well, there's way more free speech in the United States than in Germany, right? But in practice, I'm pretty sure I'd be in prison right now if I was publishing these things in the United States, and I'm free in Germany. So, while I actually think on paper the German free speech is significantly more limited, the reality is that, you know, Julian is stuck in this embassy as a result of the pressure of the United States government. Snowden is stuck in Russia because of the pressure of the United States government. And we're not really living up to those promises. And that is a failure, again, of the state, I think. And Angela, you chose now this number one enemy of the states, of the United States as a topic, and um, you look at him as a sexual aggressor, as a Robin Hood of the internet, as a savior. 
Uh, what was the strongest reaction you got from audiences, media, and do you feel you're caught in the middle of a propaganda war? <coughs> yes, uh, well, uh, during the last two years, it's nearly two years when I had the opening night in, in Hamburg, then we went to Vienna, then to Berlin, and finally to Köln, uh, and that was just two months ago, I guess. And um, the new version, it was the second version actually that I did for Cologne. A reload with Snowden. But the strongest uh, reaction was actually at the time when we did it in Vienna because that was also when the discussion about the rape case escalated. And I, uh, for the first time in my life, I got really threatened by people. They, there were radical feminist groups from the university who wrote an open letter to the theater that they should ban the play. And I was really surprised to have that from left people because to ban art, I mean, they didn't even see the play. It was only based on an interview that I gave uh, for the Freitag, I think. And uh, in the interview, they asked me um, if I think that Julian Assange is a rapist. And I said no, and I, but I elaborated on it. But they only picked up this one no. And then I was accused uh, to be a supporter of uh, rape culture which I'm of course not, and, and it, it was really, they attacked it also on the theater outside, no stage for rapists, and um, yeah, there was a big problem, and yeah, the story is really long, and we had a lot of discussion after every play, I would have to make a panel after it, and discuss with the audience, and most of the time it was about the sexual things, so it was really, at that time it was really difficult, I was uh, attacked a lot. And so people saying I'm just a groupie or something. It was ridiculous, actually. Have you been uh, intimidated in any way yourself? Well, a little bit, also because people sent some threatening emails to the theater. And um, yeah, I never experienced that before. And I thought, OK, it's art. You know, people, you can see it. You can, can be against it. You can criticize it. But this uh, aggressive reaction, I. Yeah, I was intimidated a bit, but of course, uh, I, I did it anyway, you know, so... And it would have been ridiculous for a theater in Austria to forbid a play, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's other times, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, as you, as you say, probably the gossip part was uh, extremely... The feedback regarding gossip was probably bigger than, than, than expected, or probably also not. But, um, Jacob. The role of whistleblowers should be probably a different one of hackers and uh, or hackers and whistleblowers today in such a complex technical and also political world. So, how would you describe then the the real role of whistleblowers today? Well, I, I think you know the notion of whistleblowing was. I mean, there isn't a word in German as I understand it for whistleblowing, which is kind of strange. Um, you guys have a different word for everything. So why not that? Um, get on that, linguists. But uh, I mean, it seems to me like the role of a whistleblower is actually the role of showing us the internal workings, the transparency that is missing from some of these structures. So if you really want to understand a structure, I mean, this is Julian Assange's big accomplishment in life. If he has one accomplishment, it is to recognize that when um, an agency, whether it's a government agency or a corporation or even individuals, when they want to put forward one face to the world, they have a press release. And that tells you what they want you to know. And if you have an internal document, it tells you what they really think. It tells you the internal processes by which they decide things. And a whistleblower can bring out the truth, where the truth is how they actually act and how they behave. And so part of the role of a whistleblower in modern society is to be able to change the dialogue from the press release to the actual internal workings of it. This is what Daniel Ellsberg did when he was working with McNamara and the Pentagon Papers were leaked. He showed that there's the official narrative and then there's the truth. And in the truth, they admit to lying, they admit to killing people, they admit to all these things they would never say in a press release because they're not proud of it. And that allows us to actually have a functioning democracy when it comes to the validity of these institutions and the decisions they make. So if we wish to understand how some of these organizations actually function, and thus to see if they are valid. We must have this. We must have the unvarnished truth. Now, of course, there's a tension there, because in theory, you should be able to have an organization without worrying about these things always becoming a part of the public dialogue. But clearly, in some cases, there is a tension where it's gone far, far too, you know, to one side. Like, there's an organization that's, I don't know, has death squads, for example. 
maybe actually we should reveal that. That's in the public interest, it's something that's very clear. Or maybe there's, for example, mass surveillance of the entire world. Hey, what about that, right? Things where it's blatantly illegal, something where it's just over the top, it's clear. It's not always clear when it's something smaller, but in the case of Snowden and Chelsea Manning, it's, I mean, it couldn't possibly be more obvious. And so the role of the whistleblower, in a sense, is to act as an entropy. That is, to introduce some entropy into this discussion, which is unpredictable, but in many cases truthful. And it's truth written by the hand of the oppressor themselves, in some cases. And so that's very powerful, because it means that a single person can take an action that will discredit all of the most credible people you could imagine, because in fact they are not credible people. But they have a structure that supports them and makes them seem more credible. So that's a very important role, but it's also a dangerous role. And I think if Snowden were Chinese, for example, you would have asylum here in Germany, which tells you something about the way we really value that here. And I think that that's a little sad, actually. And in the US, it's much the same. If someone from China had done what Snowden had done, he would have asylum in the United States. And there's a lot of uh, political stuff wrapped up in that. And so the role of the whistleblower is also the role of, um, depending on how it's framed, of this person being treasonous or being bad, and so there's some question about what it means to be a whistleblower, especially in the Western societies. And I think we should see that when it's clearly in the public interest, this is clearly a defining thing that makes them a whistleblower. For example, selling secrets makes them a spy. That's espionage. Yeah. Telling the whole world that there's criminal activity going on, that's not what spies do. Spies don't blow their own operation that way. That's not, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so the role of the whistleblower is really to act as entropy, I think. I like this uh, uh, statement from, from Sarah Harrison when she said, courage is contagious. Is it? Are they more and more? I hope so. So originally that was coined by Daniel Ellsberg, co-opted by Julian Assange, and recently reset by Sarah Harrison. And I totally agree. Reset. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I think yeah, courage is contagious, but um, you know, cur courage, courage is not the absence of fear, I should say. I think it's important to know that Every person that we talk about, they have a lot of, I think angst is the right word for it, about a lot of these issues, about making the right decision and, and really trying to change this dialogue. And so there's courage, but it isn't without serious consideration, without serious side effects. I mean, Sarah can never, probably for the rest of her life, set foot in her own country again, right? And so that courage comes with a lot of other things. So it's, it should be said in a humble way, I think, when she says that, and it is a humble thing. Talking about contagious, um, Angela, with your play, do you think that it's something that is um, sort of a call to action? Because when I watch your play, I feel you're torn between what is legal, what is illegal, what is true, what is not true. You are playing with the different aspects, leaving the basically the viewer with up to his own mind. So, do you want to activate them? Is that what's behind it? And then if yes, how? Yes. Uh Actually, I want people to uh, start thinking about it and activate it, that's right, because I don't feel that my play is taking sides so much. I mean, I myself, as a person, I am taking sides. In the meantime, since I learned so much, also through Jake and other people from this scene, it's not only Julian that I met, but many, many people. For example, I met him when it happened in Vienna. He, he sent me an email saying, okay, can I help you? I will sit on the panel and, and take the discussion. So that's how we first met, and he did it then the next time in Berlin here at the Hau. So yeah, I think I want to activate people because I think it should be also... Um, the, the play uh, opens many questions. It has some provocation in it, but it's not a play that extremely takes sides. There is also humor in it. I, I sometimes make a little bit fun of Julian. I mean, also, as you saw in the, in the trailer, um, I don't have a guy with a, a white wig on heads <laughs> coming on stage. I decided to, to take 13 uh, masked gorillas. At some point we also take the masks off, of course, but I wanted to avoid to put an uh, actor on stage and claim this is Julian Assange. It, it can turn out very ridiculous when you do that, because with a living person especially, you know, it, it was impossible, so for me it was an ideal a way to play with it and many of the actors and even actresses at some point uh, get into the role of Julian so it's a little bit like everybody could be him you know 
So yeah, it it, it uh, and we always had such a strong reaction from the audience that I wish uh, I had had before when I like years ago I did the Cherry Orchard by Chekhov, which is really a beautiful play. But you know, people would just go home and think, ah, my world is okay, you know. And actually, it's not okay. And, and that's why I think uh, that I feel obliged as a as an artist and as a theater person to kind of yeah say no, it's not okay. I think it's hard to activate people, probably. Yeah, I think you, you need to shock them, right? What you also do with your current play, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Which play I did with uh, Jake? Yeah, with Jake Jake almost yeah. died on stage. Yes. Um, I'm not so sure. I, I, I myself don't receive it as shocking. I don't know. Maybe I have different standards. You can still but... walk on your right foot. <laughs> 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 okay, that's true. But maybe you can explain a, a little bit about the play because it's, it was very fragile, very very personal. So the, the new play is called Überleben unter Überwachung. Yeah, yeah. Survival, survival and this way, it's right? Um, and it, yeah. Yeah. So, so you can say something about it. So it was actually, um, yeah, I would say the most <laughs> miserable experience of my entire life on stage. <laughs> and it's always a pleasure to work with Angela. And uh, so I don't mean to say that it wasn't. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> but the, the, the play was uh, actually originally supposed to be just a discussion like this. This is what we agreed to with the theater. And um, my long-term partner and I uh, split up. And for various reasons, the theater communicated with her about the play. And uh, it turned from a panel to a play. And then it turned out that we had like a four-act play. And then it turned out that the play would still involve some public lecture portion, and then she had written a, a huge amount of material for the intermediate points between the talk and, and a closure. And um, yeah, it was uh, emotionally traumatic, and then physically traumatic as well, because the way that we played it out it was basically that we wanted to talk about our internal mental states. I don't know why we wanted to do this. Originally, we just wanted to talk about mass surveillance, and then it turned into this situation where we were sort of purging the things we had lived through in our relationship, actually. And so it was extremely emotionally draining, and we hired some real security guards to um, sort of reenact some of the experiences we've had, like me being disappeared. Because a number of times while we've been traveling together, I'll literally be going through a checkpoint, and some big goons will take me away, and then they'll tell her that I don't exist. Like, oh, she'll ask, where is my boyfriend? And they'll say, there is no boyfriend, what are you talking about? And so that happened to me, I don't know, a whole bunch of times with her. And in this case, it was a little more rough, so they stripped me naked on the stage, threw me on the ground, and they kind of threw me a little too hard, so they sort of splashed my entire foot open and then dragged me bleeding, kicking, and screaming around the stage, so there's this bloody drag mark on the stage. It was, um, it was a thing. Actually, not funny, but... Yeah, it was shot in Florida, I think was the phrase, but or flamshim or something between the two of them. But it was, uh, it was horrific. And then she talked about what it was like to be a woman living under surveillance, what it's like to meet people, what it's like to date people under surveillance. How, I mean, in a sense, she sort of described, I think it's Eugene Inesco's rhinoceros. Uh, in a sense, she sort of described a modern female version of the madness of trying to maintain your integrity and your mental state in a surveillance state where your partner is being targeted and where you are being targeted because of this notion of the, the valid target or targeted surveillance being somehow okay. And in the end, it ended with me standing naked on stage without glasses, talking about the internal state, which that was a, that was a thing. If you ever, you know, it's like a first date, I think, but with 200 people you don't want to sleep with, <laughs> watching you, something horrible for sure. And um, you know, at the same time, it was really cathartic. And we, um, I think we were able to make it work really well, which was to show really truly how we felt about living under surveillance, being a so-called valid target, and some of the ways in which really literally we have been like taken away or held or questioned, um, and what it does, how it's corrosive, how it eats away at your soul, essentially. And in the end of the play, um, I was grabbed again. This time I was already naked, so they didn't strip my clothes, but they dragged me again and threw me outside of the theater. Um, which was very funny for the people standing outside of the theater because all of a sudden there's this like, strange naked guy. And then the lights go off, everyone starts to applaud, and then the lights go back on. And then for security reasons, everyone who wanted to applaud us and thank us for the play, they were immediately removed from the theater for security reasons. So we, what we wanted to do was to show them the emotional state and how they had an emotional desire. 
and then we wanted to deny them that arbitrarily and capriciously. And so they were really angry, actually. Yes, they were angry because they didn't believe that they have to leave. So many of them just said, like, no, we refuse to go. So there was basically a guy from the theater for 15 minutes fighting with the audience because they insisted on the applause. But we wouldn't wow. give it to them. So it was, that might have been the most provocative moment, I think, to break with the rules, say, no, we will not get you to, to have this, rev uh, to get relief, because it was very intense and it was not that private. I think this, you are a very good uh, example of how the private becomes political. And uh, that's why I, because usually I never do so fragile, very personal stuff on stage. I, but in this case, I thought it's, it's just to turn up the volume and to make it for people more, uh, uh, the experience more intense to see what it also means and um, that we don't, that it's just not this illusion of total freedom that things happen which can uh, affect their own lives or the lives of their children at some point, you know, because of the merging. Uh, what I found most shocking about this whole surveillance uh, revelation is how the military, the in intelligence services and states are forming or merging into this weird transnational thing that, that I don't still have a name for, but it's very threatening and, and I don't have the feeling that anybody of our politicians really has control <coughs> over that thing because it's just like a weird dynamic which is covering the, nearly the whole world and, and I don't have the feeling that it's really controllable, not even for Obama himself. So. Yeah, that's why I think we need to turn up the volume, and that's what we did with this performance, I think. Yeah, and it was, it was really intensely personal for Leger, who's my, my long-term partner. She, I think, was able to drive home some of the things that are corrosive in particular, such as she woke up in the middle of the night with two men watching her sleep with night vision goggles. In her bed, she was naked, she looks up, there's a guy looking at her with night vision goggles, like something out of Silence of the Lambs. And so, naturally, in that case, you would pick up the phone and call the police, unless it's the state that's doing that to you, which is exactly the case. So when she did call the police the next day, they laughed at her and refused to take a police report. And it took three times, and eventually getting the ACLU involved, the American Civil Liberties Union, it was only then that the police would take it seriously. So part of this play was to talk about how this is the last outlet for her to be able to deal with these things, because all of the normal channels were, were either silenced or without any real purpose. And that, I think, was very cathartic for her. It was very cathartic for all of us to be able to do this together, but it was also very traumatizing to relive all of these things. And then I, I haven't actually been able to walk correctly since this happened last Saturday because they actually hurt me so badly on stage. They, like, ripped my tendon partially, and yeah, my blood was everywhere. It was very German sorry, art world. It sounds <laughs> very painful, scary, and unbelievable at the same time and taking into consideration what Angela just said, the global level that is adding to it, do you feel that there's any country out there that is not repressive, not restrictive, and you as a person of interest, is there anywhere where you do feel safe? Well, I mean, all states have problems, they're states, um, so I, I tend to think that, you know, every place is what you make it, and right now I feel relatively okay in Germany, but I don't... Yeah, I don't, I don't really see a lot of countries that don't have intelligence services. I mean, Iceland is an example of a country that doesn't, but it has plenty of other problems. Like, Julian once pointed out that it has 100% literacy because it's xenophobic and racist, and they're basically only letting white people that are well-educated. So, I mean, it depends on what you, I, I don't know, totally agree with him about that, but it depends on what you <coughs> look at as a state and how you see it. I have certain privileges that are afforded to me. If I was a, a Muslim living on a Ranabago Platz, I would probably not feel so great about Germany, for example. Um, so every place is different, but for the for the Secret Service stuff, I mean, the U.S. is totally off the rails. It's really unbelievable, and Germany is too, to some extent, because the U.S. Secret Service has great influence over the BND and the Verfassungsschutz. And yeah, I mean, you know, even some of the like the great countries that are you know in theory changing this, like Ecuador or Iceland, I think you know. They, they have problems too. No place is perfect. And so what we should really be trying to do is to talk about what we'd like to see out of these states and trying to make them better and to change them. And in Germany, there's a parliamentary investigation that will happen about the spying, which I think 
can make a big difference, and Germany can play a big role in choosing a different paradigm. So hopefully that will happen. But if it doesn't happen with Germany, I'm not sure which country will actually start to make those choices soon. It's not the US, that's for sure. Have you been invited by the parliament or any um, say, official institution here in Germany to share your insights and your experiences? I mean, they always talk about Edward Snowden who's far away and stuff could do, but you're here and you have access. Um, a little, uh, so yes, uh, the, Euro the Council of Europe and the European Parliament have both invited me to testify uh, and to speak about the mass surveillance issues, and I've done that. The German Parliament is, um, well, I was once invited to a CDU event after the election where they wanted me to come and talk about um, basically all the mass surveillance issues, and I was invited, and I said, sure, I'd love to come. I don't really know anything about your politics, but I want to talk to you about the threat that this is to a free society. And uh, they said, we'd love to have you. If you could speak, it would be really fantastic. And I said, sure, I'll see you there. They gave me the date, they gave me the time. I guess you know where I'm going with this. And then the day before the event, they apologized and let me know that normally they don't have members from civil society involved in their events. And so they regretted to inform me that they would have to uninvite me. Uh, and so I think there's something interesting there where they recognized I had something to contribute, but maybe I wouldn't toe the line on all their other issues, so they didn't want me. But Strobel is office, um, uh, he's really fantastic. And he's asked me to explain some of the technical issues, and I explain what we've written about in Der Spiegel, basically in really bad, broken German. And he's very thankful about that. And he you know, sort of told me that if something comes up where I should need some help, that they, I should ask. Uh, but realistically, I think that you know, in terms of this issue, the German government doesn't really want to dig into it. I mean, for example, if you read uh, the work by John Goetz, the, he's a really fantastic uh, journalist here in Germany at NDR and Süddeutsche Zeitung. He um, has been working a great deal on drone-related stuff, and he has a thing that's called uh, Geheimnisplieg, and he wrote a book and has a film, and basically it's all about Germany's role in the U.S. drone strikes, how the targeting happens, how the murder happens, and this is a, these are assassinations that the German government is participating in. Um, and that is um, also something that the German government is not looking into. They're not inviting John very often to the parliament, as I understand it. So I think there's some culpability there where the discussion is not actually as out in the open as one would expect it to be, which is a little sad, actually. So when you look at the new building of the BNB, you're not really excited about the size, scope, and possibilities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, incredible, actually. Um, it's incredible to me that the BND is getting a new building and how large it is. It's, in, it's actually unbelievable. I mean, secret services undermine the, I think, fundamentally the notion of transparent, open, democratic processes. These things happen in secret. They amass huge amounts of data that they use, and they use them for things that are not at all consistent with what we would consider reasonable in society. They use them for blackmail, for economic espionage, for assassinations. When we build buildings for people like that, we are supporting those kinds of activities, economically, literally, and politically. Uh, and that, to me, is terrifying. Um, I, I, I literally just can't even believe that Germany is continuing down that path after two dictatorships. I mean, it's like <coughs> crazy. And people will bring up this notion of open societies and their enemies. So you have to play this game to have an open society. You have to have some of these sort of sin eaters you know, where, they, where they're there to do the dirty deeds that the rest of society doesn't need to do, um, which is essentially making a commitment to anti-democratic ideals to maintain a supposed democracy. And I think that's really a dangerous paradigm. Um, I think, for example, if you look at Norway and Brevik, you know, when this guy went out and murdered huge numbers of Norwegian people, they did not do what the United States did after 9-11. They did not destroy their society to save it. Instead, they really went down the path of punishing one person using their specific laws that they already had, and they put this guy in jail, and sure, they won't bring those people back. But all the vengeance in the world that we see after September 11th won't bring those people back either. But the difference is that the US now, and I think Germany has a little bit of this as well, you know, celebrates the deaths of people now. Like, uh, when we assassinated Osama bin Laden, as an example, and we did assassinate Osama bin Laden, I might add, when that happened, there were people in the United States that were dancing in the streets. When September 11th happened more than 10 years ago, the thing that was the most horrifying to me and to most Americans was that people were dancing in the streets in support of some 
innocent people or guilty people dying. And we have made that shift. And I think that when we choose secret services, we make a similar shift, which is away from the basic Green Gazette's, the basic constitutional values of our societies. And it is, in a sense, our society is changing and not for the better. As you say, um, right now, these buildings, um, these intelligent buildings, are in the middle of the cities. They're not hiding away, they're uh, like BND or the, uh, the NSA. What is democracy then? Is it an empty ritual? It's a question to both of you. Mm. I'm not sure uh, if it's an empty ritual. Well, one might think that being very pessimistic in a way, because I don't have the feeling there's much to choose, you know. But uh, what I find very frightening uh, is um, how big these um, um, organizations became. Yeah, it's um, when I did the reload um, of assassinate Assange, and that was just after Snowden happened. I I met Julian and. We talked about that, and he had a very interesting analogy. He said um, that the, the surveillance system and the intelligence uh, agencies are, he compared it to a liver, which um, becomes too big in a body, because your liver is supposed to, to detox and help you live. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, uh, to a certain degree, it, uh, every state needs uh, intelligence, right? Because, uh, well... For obvious reasons, you know, states. it would be yes, states. They, they, it would be uh, naive to say, okay, let's abandon it. You know, but um, at a certain point, when you get liver cancer, it gets just too big, too big. It too, takes too much energy and also money, actually, because all this has to be paid, and it's getting way out of proportion. You know, okay, so it's a little bit like the, 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 It is killing the system that it lives in. So the. It, it, at a certain moment, it can collapse, and and then even he said to me, and this is the optimistic version. Mm -hmm. The pessimistic is that it doesn't collapse and it just goes on and on and on. So you know, I, I find that very very frightening actually to see that. Yeah. What do you think about it? Jane? Well, I think the autoimmune disorder analogy is a good one, but I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example of why I'm disgusted by the intelligence services. First of all, there's this notion that they're valid and that we need them. Fuck that, we don't need them. That's a total lie. Some intelligence services have very specific jobs which we do need. For example, stopping people from smuggling atomic weapons, we all agree that that should be done. There's no question that that should not happen. But it doesn't need to be done in secret, and it doesn't need to be the case that we destroy our fundamental liberties to make that job happen. So there are specific tasks which are great, yes. But that has nothing to do with being done by an intelligence service. There are lots of things that can be done in different ways. And the example of why I think it's so scary is one which I don't usually tell the story very often, but I think it's worth elucidating what democracy really is. Um, some people approached me that said that they were with the Canadian security establishment. So they're basically the NSA or the BND of Canada. And they offered me a job. And I said that I wasn't interested in their job. And they said, well, come on, you can have a passport. And I said, no, I don't want to wait in line. That's just awkward. Plus, I'm a proud American. And they were like, don't worry. There's no line for you. Just come work with us. And I said, you know, I really don't want to because you have a monarchy. And I'm disgusted by the idea of royalty. <laughs> and they said, come on, the queen has no power. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to prop up your monarchy regardless if it has power. I'm an American. And being born in America, I'm disgusted by hereditary power. And I have no interest in that. I like the idea of being able to vote for a leader. I like to be able to have a representative democracy. I said, well, how do you think Stephen Harper makes decisions as the Prime Minister of Canada? And I said, well, I think what you're going to tell me is that you put some choices on his table, and then he picks whatever you would be okay with. And they said, yeah, exactly. That's right. We put three choices down in front of him, and he gets to choose between any three, and there's no wrong choice. That's democracy, kid. And I said, wow, that's incredible. I want to work to destroy your world because you are against everything that I have been raised to believe about free societies. You are subverting the fundamental trust that has been given to you. And they said, well, how about it? Don't you want to join? The NSA signs off on every single one of our hires. So don't worry, no one will be upset with you in America if you join the Canadian version of the NSA. They said something slightly different. And I said, yeah, it's, gosh, this is like, you, you can't say no to this question, right? Because I keep saying no, and you won't let me say no. And he's like, just, you know, sleep on it, think about it. You should really consider it. 
This is, you want to change the world? This is your chance to change the world, kid. And I was with someone else, and he said, yeah, let's do it. Come on, let's join up. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, I want to tell you about imperialism, and we're not near these people, and I want to talk to you about how fucked up this is. And my friend said, well, I don't know, I really think we should do it. And I said, absolutely not. Let's not do that. Let's leave before we can't leave. And so we left, and we talked about imperialism. We talked about how it was that his country came to, to, to exist, how it was that these kinds of things created the world that he was from. He's from Lebanon. And the problems that he has, and how non-democratic actions drastically affect the world. In fact, how the Middle East is carved up right now comes from these non-democratic actions. And that, to me, suggests that the democracy in Canada, according to these spies, is a charade. And it suggests that some people know it's a charade, and they're proud of it, and they use it as a recruiting tool. So, your mileage may vary here in Germany, but my guess is that, since you haven't cleaned house with the Verfassungsschutz and the NSU scandal, that, that, to me, says that you probably have a similar problem. It sounds very much like a structural problem. And, uh, Looked up the structure of the, of the NSA, found out it's divided in depart departments and subdivisions, and there's a subdivision customer relations, and you wonder who's the customer, and then you realize the customer is the White House or the FBI. So, uh, is it maybe that these uh, organizations create their own structures, their own logic, and that we have to fight them? So, I I think it's very important to be careful about how you frame this because. I don't view myself as having a war with the United States or fighting anything. Rather, I, I view myself as trying to, with journalism, tell the truth about what is actually happening. And in some cases, there are people that wish the truth to not come out. They didn't want people to know that the NSA was spying on Merkel, for example. That, to them, was important to hide. And I think that there are injustices. And, I, for example, the drone murders, that is a function of the structure. I think when you, for example, have the keys to the kingdom, you start to use them. When you have the ability to kill people without having a jury, without having um, a judge involved, I mean, the idea of having the death penalty is so barbaric, it's pretty strange, but in the US, we have the death penalty in a lot of places. And so the idea that they have that, naturally they go two steps further. And I think that is a structural thing, and I think this injustice is in fact an emergent phenomenon of the structure and the organization itself. So by having an intelligence agency, you're sure that you'll have people that behave as if they're in a Jean Le Carre novel. You'll have people that for sure think that they're above the law, and in fact, they are. And that's, in fact, the lesson is that they are able to do these things. They are living the modern Jean Le Carre novel, and they're proud of it. And that's a social cost, which I'm hoping that with Angela and with other people, we can change the social cost. So every time you find out someone's in the BND, cross legs movement, ladies, gentlemen. Don't sleep with them, right? Yeah, yeah. Raise the social cost for being a criminal spy so high that they quit their jobs and go do something that is more respectful. Very good, so you heard him. <laughs> uh, Jacob, you were one of the first uh, people who got insights to the uh, documents from Edward Snowden regarding the NSA. Could you describe um, the techniques kind of on the hardware and on a software level. What well, was was shocking, what you saw. Well, for the most part, um, I think, it, you know, we live in a world where there's a theory, which is that you communicate with someone else and then that's spied upon. But actually, the world we live in, we have sensors, we have credit cards, we have cars, we have all these electronic systems that they bleed data out onto the internet. There are also intentional communications. What was most interesting is that the NSA, the GCHQ, the BND, um, the CSE, the DSD, you name it, there's so many of these agencies. What they do is they try to collect absolutely everything, to put it into databases, and they remove the agent, in some cases, from the loop. So they have algorithms that decide if you're a terrorist. This kind of stuff is the most scary to me, because if you look at something like the lives of others, there's this quaint guy who walks around and he like thinks about it and he writes notes and sometimes he doesn't write notes because he wants to cover for them because he realizes that one note in one direction might be too much and it's not actually what it would seem. And that guy is completely removed from a lot of these systems. And that is, I would say, the most shocking. So for example, when uh, Jeremy Scahill and Glenn Greenwald wrote about the drone 
murder stuff in, 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 in The Intercept, they talked about how what they're actually doing is they're targeting phones. They're targeting the metadata of the people. And if you happen to take my phone that day, and I was in Yemen and I was targeted, you get the drone strike, not me. And only usually after the fact do they actually realize that they've killed an innocent person. Right? This is the reason that we have due process in the West, in theory, right? It's the reason in the US you're supposed to have a trial by jury. And what I found the most shocking is because it is technologically possible for the NSA to help the CIA with these things, and to help the BND with these things, they just do it. And because it's done in secret, and there's no adversarial process, they just do it thousands of times and get away with it. And so I mean, we can talk about the planetary surveillance that we all contribute to and that you can't really opt out. You can choose not to make a phone call, but you can't choose not to pay your rent, right? So you're always leaving some data behind. Um, and the most shocking part about that, actually, is that you really can't opt out of it anymore. I mean, I don't have a cell phone, really, but it doesn't matter because every person around me has a cell phone. But this is the Philip K. Dick nightmare world that we're living in, where, in theory, you have to worry about everyone being a spy, but in the Philip K. Dick world, you have to worry about everything being a spy. And that's what these people have done. Like the Internet of Things, then. Yeah, for example, the for Internet example. of Things. Yeah. So do you feel we're in the age of post-privacy, and is, is there a way back? We're not in the age of post-privacy. That's a rich white people paradigm that I don't understand at all, right? I mean, ask a woman in this room if she has a double consciousness, right? How do I look? How do I look to an attacker on the street? Right? I mean, we, we don't live in a post-privacy world because we're not in a post-privileged world, but we are living in, I think, something that could be considered post-democratic in some ways, or maybe post-civil liberties, right? The idea of the Fourth Amendment in the United States is that unreasonable search and seizure is not allowed. And as Snowden recently pointed out, the US government and the German government and many other governments around the world have decided that, in fact, seizure is fine. They can do it as much as they want. They can just take whatever they feel. And, and you know, and searching, well, it's okay. And so the, the problem is that this fundamental thing is just gone in the modern world when it comes to electronic surveillance, which just so happens to be the place that all of us are simultaneously while being in this room. Every person that has a cell phone, for example, could you raise your hand? Right? So you all have civil liberties in this room, but the NSA, the BND, the rest of these groups, they would say that those electronic devices you're carrying, they don't have that. The problem is that it's indistinguishable from you. So these laws should apply there, and that's, that's the post we're living in, like post anything. It's not post-privacy, though. Um, unfortunately, I think that the whole post-privacy movement that exists is, it's diluted. It's like a coping mechanism, like, well, you know, you're not allowed to wear you're not allowed to wear these clothes anymore. And you, you know, we're just post-clothing, you know? Just deal with it, it's okay, just learn to love it. Learn to love not being free. Fuck those people, they're crazy. They're absolutely crazy, because I'm not me when I don't have a private sphere. I'm not me when I have to worry about everyone else constantly examining everything that I do. It's just, that's a post-existence in some ways. So what do you say then to people when they say, I don't have anything to hide? This is a very common reaction, I think, to the current situation. If you said that to me, I'd say I'm a Jew in Germany and you're a woman in the world. Also, people without secrets are boring. That's true. <laughs> I mean, the, the notion of having nothing to hide shows a shallowness in the analysis. So, for example, it's not about whether or not I have something to hide. I mean, I do have something to hide, right? Everyone has something to hide. But I also have a choice. And part of my ability to choose, part of my dignity, my agency is stolen from me. When you know everything, when you predict everything, when you record everything, when you watch everything, when you rifle through all my papers, when you know where I look on the page of a book. So obviously we all have something to hide that's without question. But the question is if we have a right to say no. And that is something that we should, I think, clearly say, yes, we have a right to say no. We have a right to have privacy in our homes. We have a right to choose if we should be stripped of our clothes. We have a right to dignity. And that's what we're really talking about. And to suggest that we are just talking about having something to hide is very naive. And it also, it's a matter of class privilege in a lot of cases, which is not falling on the right side of reality. You said that in a way, um, we generate the whole time data. And there's people who uh, trade their private data for the convenience of certain apps and then don't basically give away the rights for this information in, in many ways. And then you have the big players um, who grab that information. So how do you feel about these people and what do you want to tell them? 
and the, the app and the producers of such apps? Well, I mean, I refer to Facebook as Stasi book because I think it's it is the case that you're you're constantly reporting on your friends all the time, and in many cases, Facebook has special relationships with law enforcement where they'll give up that data. They wouldn't give it to me, but they will give it to the police. They will give it to the police that I don't think are legitimate police, for example. And I think that's wrong. We should build alternatives. But I also think we shouldn't fault people for living in the times that we're living in. What choices do we really have? I mean, it is a privilege that I can exist without a cell phone. And not everyone has that privilege. So we need to build alternative structures, and we need to build alternative communication systems for that. And we should recognize, I think, with things like Facebook, it does not mean people do not care about their privacy. It means that the public sphere where we would meet, like a public square, it has been replaced by an American corporation where people participate in that because there isn't an alternative for them, really. What alternative is there to that? I mean, there's real life, but if you have a social graph that spreads across many cities, or you have family members that used to use the phone, but now they want to send a photo, what alternative do they really have for fulfilling that? And I think that the reason Facebook is successful is because it does meet a need that people have. But that does not mean that people don't have particular values. It just means they haven't yet found a way to express those things in a way that respects those values, actually. And so we should persevere and build a system that does respect our autonomy, that does respect our liberty, that does allow us to share our lives and to connect with people. Angela, how did you uh, change your perspective on uh, privacy, <coughs> public, and your, your, your uh, usage of technology, for instance? Well, <clears throat> it changed a lot. At a certain point, uh, I found myself uh, just censoring myself. When at a certain point, uh, I've just been too often in the Calorian Embassy. I think at a certain moment, I, I felt I might be also watched more actively than the rest of the people. And so I uh, find myself, I realize that I censor myself. I just instinctively wouldn't uh, communicate any more openly with my emails, it was just a feeling like somebody is just, yeah, just the possibility that somebody can read it, you automatically censor yourself. And um, so at a certain point I decided to use encryption, but okay, to be honest, it's it's a total pain in the ass. Uh, sorry for, for saying it like this, because basically also I'm too lazy, you know, because it's still very complicated, so it would be actually great if someone would invent a solution to just make it very easy for people to use it. I mean, I, I did uh, in, in Cologne uh, um, last time when we showed the Assassinate Assange play for some weeks ago, we made the first uh, crypto party in a state theater. And it was totally crowded. Many old people came, which uh, the typical bourgeois theater goer, and I was very surprised. We didn't expect that. And they all wanted to know how it goes. I mean, it's not even that... Uh, complicated or difficult, it's more inconvenient, I'd say, you know, and, uh, but still it was, uh, I, we were all overwhelmed that it was, uh, that there was a need for it, and I was really surprised, because the people are aware of it, you know, and for me it's, okay, when I really uh, uh, want to exchange information which I think should stay private, uh, I use encryption PGP, and, and also, okay, I, have some other things going on, but I yeah, it's it's not uh, that easy. I mean, I also I, I, um, when I when I go more and more into this topic, I also read all the stuff about this encryption thing. It was not very easy to get Jacob actually without the phone. I mean, there are a lot of challenges, you know, with if you're not on the grid. And um, uh, but I also uh, say that it's it's a it's a thing of conveniency. Conveniency and security is not are not two things who get in together. It's my perspective. What is it's? I mean, you are more in the in the peer to peer software or not peer to peer, but in encryption uh, 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 features and all these these kind of tools. It's. I mean, ev everything what is easy to use is unsecure. This is my perspective. There, there are some examples. I think there are different, like Red Phone and Tech Secure by Moxie Marlin Spike, are free Android apps, um, which soon will also be on the iOS. I think they're actually both secure and easy to use. Uh, things like off-the-record messaging and PGP. I think PGP is the least usable, but it's very important anyway. And I tend to agree that it's the user interface and, in fact, the fact that people can advertise a thing as being private or secure when actually it's neither of those things is, 
it's a problem, it's confusing. But I mean, at the same time, part of the issue here is that, imagine uh, an analogy. Which So I grew up in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in the 80s and the 90s, when everyone was dying from HIV. And so I, I spent a lot of time in a hair salon that my parents owned, which is a strange story. I'll tell you about the glue factory. But uh, the short version of it is many gay men that worked in this hair salon died from AIDS. And one of the lessons we learned is that if you want to engage in risky behavior, you have to protect yourself. This was the lesson that a lot of people refused to learn because they thought they were exempt from HIV. And so they didn't want to wear condoms, for example. If you're going to engage in risky behavior, you have to protect yourself. But there's also a societal part that is important. For example, raising awareness, building alternatives. And right now, when it comes to communications, we have the same, we have an epidemic. It's a serious epidemic. And if you happen to be located in Yemen, and you happen to be a Muslim, then it's a terminal illness, <coughs> potentially. And I think that that is sad, but also true. But we can change that a lot. But it's still an individual choice where we have to have an education about this topic, where we have to raise our consciousness about it. And that's a very difficult thing, where we have to constantly repeat this in public if we know about it. And so there's a war on your privacy. And then to paraphrase Bill Hicks, every time you use encryption and anonymity software, you're winning it. Right? And I think that that's something which we need to make usable, we need to make it very positive, but the state also has to respect your autonomy. Right? Your phone is a tracking device that makes phone calls that the state can install the state's Trojan on, for example, where they get to take over the core of your life. And they assert that they have the right to do that. Well, what's the difference between them and a criminal organization that takes over your phone? I think you're touching a very important point, and I think before we uh, open up the floor for the Q&A, um, one more thing, as you say, it's the governments that should be respecting our privacy. In Germany, we have something called Postgeheimnis, and I wouldn't expect them to open my letters or open my packages or have to use a super glue for my uh, envelope that I give the antidote to the counterpart. So why do I have to do that in the virtual world? So um, Mostly because the state decided that they were going to violate your fundamental liberties and didn't consult you about it. And that's why you have to, because the state has decided that it can do that. And part of the dialogue that we're having right now is that we don't want the state to have that power. So we have postal secrecy in the United States as well, but we recently learned that the US government in the form of the NSA actually, first of all, the Postal Service records all of the outsides of all the letters. That's one thing which is crazy to me, to have learned this. The other thing is that in many cases, postal service workers can also open your mail without a warrant. And this has been revealed in the New York Times recently that they have been doing this because they accidentally had a, a slip in one of the letters. And the person who was targeted found the slip in his own mail, which basically alerted him to this fact. Then what I revealed with Der Spiegel in December was that the NSA is also doing this, that when you buy a computer, that they'll actually take your mail, open your mail, replace part of the computer, and then send it on to you. So why is this happening? It's happening because without transparency, government agencies like corporations have this sickness of power where they expand and then they abuse it. So it's really only transparency that will help us here, but it's only a full court press for democracy where we all have the ability to decide about this. That's the only way that we can change that, I think. And that, that we don't have that right now is why this is happening. So we need to rise uh, technical literacy, probably. Is this a solution? It's one part of the solution. Like I said, if the state does, requires your phone to be wiretappable, there's a trade-off. Right now the trade-off is that, so the BND and the Fafasung shoots can spy on me, when you travel abroad, everyone gets to spy on you, and I get to spy on you here, potentially, if I want. We need our technology to match our social values, and if it doesn't match the social values, where there's a discrepancy, you will lose. I think it's uh, almost time that we are open up for the Q&A right now. Is there... Um, could I have the microphone? And um, are there any questions? Um, many questions, great. Sorry. Sorry to everyone falling asleep. Hello. Get everybody to stand up and shake, shake it out. You, you said earlier um, <clears throat> that nationalism was a sickness. Is the issue here because so much of what you've discussed really relates to the runaway executive? The, the only response is not 
a state-by-state -state response, but actually a transnational response by people. Because, you know, just talking about male secrecy and privacy, has been abused by governments forever and a day. Uh, Mancini, the Italian nationalist, ironically, 150 years ago, was having his mail read by the British Parliament. And he discovered it when he started to put mustard seeds, I think, in his mail and discovered they all missed at the other end. So, it, is there any way to actually deal effectively state on state, individual against the state? This seems to be kind of impossible. And that, that does reveal democracy as a sham. Surely we should be going one step above that and trying, at least within Europe, perhaps, to create trans European politics. <coughs> Would you say that was something that we could look towards or even somehow effect? Well, I think it's a question of economics, right? And with electronics, I think that the answer is that we need to have strong international standards where when you make a phone call, your phone conversation is encrypted in your phone and it is only decryptable by the person you are calling and no one else gets to listen to it and mathematics will secure that. Nothing will change the fundamental economic value, though, of if you're an important person, someone breaking into the phone. We have to, however, change it from a mass surveillance perspective. And I think we should also dial back, in a lot of ways, the so-called you know, legitimate targeted surveillance, because we just need to basically not have conflicting issues. Like the NSA, it has both the job of integrity, that is, information assurance of your devices, and exploiting and spying. And right now, if we were to call it this, it's communication security and signals intelligence. And there's a little needle on that, right? And right now it's 100% that signals intelligence. Everything is spied, spied on or can be spied on. And with crypto, we can change it back. And I do agree that this will happen on a transnational individual level. But for it to be successful, we actually do need international standards that respect our civil liberties and our autonomy. You can't really do anything about the Postal Service, though, because the Postal Service doesn't have the equivalent of something like encryption. I mean, that's just, its I think it's just a matter of reality. And if you, for example, privatizing it doesn't make it better. What we see in the US is that those private companies are just forced by the state to become agents of the state. That's what the prison program is all about. So. Is, is it not the, the case though, that the internet is getting break, broken up into more national blocks anyway? Russia just rebuilt a ton of internet freedoms in the last two weeks. Um, America, when well, we can come back to that, China, as you know, is firewalled anyway, and uh, countries across the Middle East, etc., have um, either banned uh, RIM, for instance, a few years ago in the Middle East, and uh, India also blocked BlackBerry's expansion because of its cryptography. So, what chance do we have of even having an international internet? I think it's really difficult, but I mean, one thing you'll notice is that India didn't ban RIM forever because eventually RIM uh, took up the job of spying uh, and helping the Indians to do that spying, I think. So, I mean, there are some trade-offs, and I think we're seeing the birth of a new politic, actually, which is this notion that you have individual liberty and that society has some privacy and security, and there are states where they just don't even pretend that that's the case. And I mean, it's clear. I mean, Russia and India, they don't pretend that you have the right to individual liberties in an electronic cryptographic form or the right to visit sites. But we're also seeing that in the West, where they're pushing this alleged internet freedom, that part of the reason they do that is because the value of surveilling is much higher than the value of censoring. So they're playing a similar game, actually. And what we may be able to convince them of is that there's an economics argument rather than a civil liberties argument, where we say that <laughs> if we are all vulnerable, then it is the case that we're all vulnerable to people who are not you not the NSA, not the FBI. And I think that that trade-off and that discussion happening in public will, will change things significantly because once people realize they're not the top of the pyramid, they tend to work for a more just system than a pyramid where they're at the bottom. Um, right now the FBI and, and the NSA, for example, they think that it's fine that your systems are vulnerable because they promise to never abuse it. Well, that doesn't make any sense if the FSB, for example, is able to abuse it. Right? They, they recognize that that's not a good trade-off for American business people that travel abroad. It's, I think Germans have the same when they really think about it. So we're going to see a development of people making that rec you know, recognition. And my hope is that it won't be a classist thing, where important business people, they're allowed to have civil liberties, but the rest of us are fucked. If that is the case, then 
I think we have some problems. And I think we'll see people resisting on an individual level with peer-to-peer -peer networks and with cryptography and with anonymity. Great. Any more questions? I was wondering, because right now in Germany there's this obsession with Silicon Valley, since WhatsApp and more. So I was just wondering, what do you think, you guys, what's the, the impact from the current Silicon Valley world that's obviously just becoming the new glamour world to, like, you, so it should be there right now? So what do you think, what, what is the impact of that world that's coming toward, towards this whole situation? Um, well, so, I mean, I'm originally from Northern California, so I'm from the other side of the bay, Silicon Valley is to the south. Um, and I think that it's, um, it has some good, but it, it, there are some people in Silicon Valley that have a lot of privilege and they don't even recognize it. They're some of the wealthiest people to have ever lived in history. They have access to the most information. And it plays out in how they build these systems. So a lot of compromises are being made with surveillance. And I think we should, we should take them to task about that. So they might be glamorous, but when they collaborate, for example, to help the Chinese build the Golden Shield Project, which is used to hunt down Falun Gong and Tibetans in service of the Chinese genocide of the Tibetan people, for example, I think we should, like I said, cross legs movement. Those people should know that they are supporting a shameful, <coughs> seriously bad political system. And we should ask them to respect civil liberties when they make these sort of businesses that won't always be successful. And I think we shouldn't use things like WhatsApp or Facebook. I think there are much better things to use, or it is better simply not to endorse them. I think Germany should be building alternatives to these systems that reflect the values of people here. And I think it's weird, the obsession with Silicon Valley is also just really strange. I've worked <coughs> in Silicon Valley at a bunch of companies, and I mean, it's, once I interviewed at Facebook, they offered me a job, and it was right before I came to work at the Torah Project. And the network engineer that I was speaking to during the interview, he said, um, oh yeah, this NARS pamphlet, we use that on AT&T. And the way he said it, he sounded like an external person who had been using this device to spy on AT&T. And then they were looking at doing it to Facebook as well. And I wondered who it was that he worked for, actually. And I think, you know, there's a huge economy which is totally unregulated, which is about information flows. And the obsession with Silicon Valley really does have to do with money without really asking at what cost is that money earned and and at what value are those unregulated information markets really and how how are those things going to impact us as free people actually so i, I mean it's weird i have a lot of friends that, that, that work in silicon valley actually i just like don't even I, I couldn't do it ever again having worked there before i think that's a great question because uh the, the biggest problem as you said uh, jacob is that we go, should go for encryption, peer-to-peer -peer encryption, but most of these business models at uh, Silicon Valley are not supporting peer-to-peer -peer encryption by, uh, by their nature in the end, because they need to analyze the, the, the data. I mean, there are advertising companies like Facebook or Google. So I think this is a definitely a huge uh, challenge we are facing. Any more voices from the audience over there on the right? Um, well, I'm a complete idiot when it comes to all those computer stuff. So, but my child is seven years old and she's bright. So where can I bring her to, to learn about these things so she can make it better? No, no pressure. Um, <laughs> I think you should send her to hang out with the KS Computer Club here in Germany, which is the oldest hacker club in the world, and um, the most radical hacker club to ever exist in some sense, but not radical in a bad way, radical in a good way. Um, examining systems, I mean, the Verfassungsgericht, for example, regularly consults the KS Computer Club when they're dealing with technological and societal issues. That, to me, is incredible. I wish the Supreme Court would call it the noise bridge say, hey, we're thinking about doing this massively privacy-violating electronic system. What do you think people would understand this technology? Okay, maybe it's also an idea for a sober house to organize a crypto party. Yeah. You know? <laughs> maybe that would be yes. the next thing. I, I think the KS Computer Club, though, it really is a place, and in fact, they have this uh, going to school program. The KS Computer Club sometimes does. I forget the name of it. Maybe you know Rob? No. But basically, they, they send people from the KS Computer Club, the volunteer, to talk to kids at school about computers, how technology works, 
But then they also talk about how there's no such thing as technology without politics. And they usually bring up Edwin Black's uh, book, IBM and the Holocaust, right? One of the first big data projects in Europe was the Holocaust. I hate to say it, but it's true. And IBM's machines, their punch card machines, had a political component. And the Chaos Computer Club is amazing, particularly because they recognize that. Talk to some of the hacker clubs in the United States about this, and they say that there is no politic. And that's because the status quo is their politics. And the Chaos Computer Club has a much more critical understanding of this, and they really examine it. And they like kids to hang out there. And if you want to immerse your child in this technological world, bring them to the open day at the Chaos Computer Club in Berlin, or take them to Seabase, maybe when they're a little older. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, also, I mean, very few people really understand this technology anyway. And people who do, they understand, like, one very small silo. So, I mean, you should come yourself if you want to. No, no, but it's not about, there's no, there's no, there's no stupidity involved, right? I mean, look, I didn't know how to speak a word of German. That's not because I'm an idiot. It's because I didn't take the time to spend, you know, my life learning it, right? You speak English and German. Does that mean I'm an idiot? No. Technology is similar, right? And, and it is much the same. And you can learn it. And anyone that makes you feel bad about that when you're learning about it is a fucking asshole. You've got to find a new teacher. Right? I mean, that's, that's the change. And if you want to, the Chaos Computer Club, I think, on Thursdays, on Millions Class, so number 11, uh, is a place where you can come and meet people. And uh, you'll see there's a bunch of people with kids, and they're helping to build the future. So you should come over too. Yeah, number 11. I think they're also planning uh, a center with, with a mouse format, right? The CCC Club. A, ch a child's format for TV, which is great. There were some other questions in there. Um, I just have a question, maybe because of, um, I'm maybe older than most of you, which is a question about um, internet and making maybe people lazy about being not necessarily an activist, but at least being engaged. And I was wondering if you think that if all the WikiLeaks or Snowden um, affairs would have happened in the 70s or the 80s, don't you think people would be more in the streets? And I have the feeling that internet, or sometimes it's so rare to see a petition, uh, but basically that people are less engaged. I see, for example, now that you have, um, you have been maybe seeing the, hearing the story in France about um, the personal advisor of Sarkozy, who has been taping hundreds of hours of conversation without telling, of course, Sarkozy. And nobody is shocked, in fact, really by that, except the media, who are talking a lot about it, but because they think it's going to move maybe something politically, and at the end of the day, we don't talk about the it's, it's essential things. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have the feeling if these Facebook or internet in general haven't been making us more lazy. Regarding activism. Well, are we just doing clicktivism? It's a very, it's a, I think it's a very difficult uh, uh, question. I, I cannot answer that uh, thoroughly. I think, I mean, I'm a bad example because actually um, the knowledge of it and getting involved first for artistic reasons but I got sucked into this topic and it's totally repolitized me I must admit so uh, and I do have the feeling that many people are very upset about it when you talk to them and they hear things my experience is they get very upset and they are absolutely uh, thinking that something should be done at the moment it's uh, difficult to get too many people on the street but it does happen and I think at a certain point, it will become even more. And also something like uh, Widerstand, when people really get uh, to be aware of what it really means, that it's not only about people reading your emails, it's really about the future and the whole cynicism. You know, when I read something like in the Spiegel, like one of the leaks by Snowden, that um, they have these uh, uh, um, PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, where uh, they call people who have an iPhone zombies and they call um, Steve Jobs the big brother, you know? I mean, this is such a 
cynical attitude that, you know, it makes you really angry. And so I think, yeah, I, there is this feeling of Unbehagen, I would say in German, yeah, that, that I think it will become more as time goes by. People have more information. Okay, we can also play, uh, speak about the role of the mass media. You mentioned it before in this case. And yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, very complicated. But I think that the more we raise the awareness, uh, people actually are interested in it. That's my uh, experience, at least. In 1971, there was a burglary in Media, Pennsylvania. And this is different than when Daniel Ellsberg took the Pentagon Papers as a worker. They knew that the FBI had interesting papers. And so a number of people broke into the Media, Pennsylvania office and leaked those documents. And from that, we learned about COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence programs, where they were spying on activists, human rights groups, peace marching groups, all sorts of different things, from Quakers to um, the Black Panthers. At the time, these kinds of things were taking place. It's happened with the Pentagon Papers, it happened with the Media Pennsylvania break-in. People were in the street, there was a huge social movement. And I actually think that we have similar things taking place today. We have the modern Daniel Ellsberg, that is Chelsea Manning, that is Edward Snowden. We have this about Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and Jessalyn Raddick from the NSA, the NSA, and the Department of Justice, respectively. And we do have Freiheitsstadt here in Berlin, for example, where thousands of people were in the streets about this topic. But we're also having a, a different discourse. So in the United States in the 70s, it was a lot about the Vietnam War. The politics today are actually about, they're, they're sort of meta-politics, about expressing your political views. And so there are people that would like to go into the streets, but they know that their going into the streets goes into a database to be used against them later. And what we do also see is that people participate in things electronically that they don't get credit for. So part of the public square is online now. And so when we see people posting on their Facebook about it, does that not mean that they care about it? In fact, does that not mean they care about it more when they understand that that goes on their permanent record? I mean, in a sense, it's more, more serious. And it's more uh, long-lasting. So I think you know, we, we, we have seen this in the past, and we're seeing the modern version of it again. The sad news is that when the people that burglarized that office of the FBI, they got away with it. Nobody even knew who they were until three months ago, two months ago, when Betty Metzger's book, The Burglary, came out. And there's a film called 1971, which I think is just about to be released, or it has been, I'm not sure. It's a fantastic film, though. I really recommend it. Same is true with Ellsberg. He walked free. Right? The president actually ordered for him, Nixon ordered for him to be permanently incapacitated on the steps of uh, the Capitol building. That is, the president ordered him to be killed. He was the first American the president ever did that to, or a president ever did that to. And this time around, we've got a really kind of scary emergence. I think Snowden being stuck in Russia because of the US government stopping him from moving on further is a terrible precedent. So this time we're actually not doing as well as the last time. We got the church committee last time. I don't know if we're going to have that. There's a parliamentary inquiry that's here, but will you deconstruct the secret service that helped to murder the Turkish people? Right, in the NSU scandal? I have my doubts about that. I mean, I'd like to see that. Why not clean house like that? And so I think going into the streets is only one part of it, and we shouldn't ignore the fact that some of the streets are different than they were in the past. And there are a lot of people that are upset about it, but it's not always clear what is to be done. I mean, if you vote for Merkel, does that mean you're for or against the surveillance state when she's a victim of the NSA's fine? I mean, what, it's, it's totally unclear. It was much clearer in the 70s, I think, but maybe it's also hindsight, because it's easy to say 50 years later or 20 years later that something is a way. It's, with hindsight, it's always the case. We're right in the middle of it right now, maybe just in the beginning, actually. Yes. Right. Civil rights movements were always um, coming out of a niche and out of, say, subversive momentum. And at this point, it feels that the digital rights movement hasn't taken off yet because it is not painful enough when your digital rights oh, so are violated. Complex, I guess, sometimes. So well, we shouldn't talk about internet freedom. We should just talk about freedom. We shouldn't talk about digital liberty. It's just liberty. It's not about you know a right, to, uh, a digital right to protection against unreasonable search and seizure. It's just the same liberty we have always had, and it must not 
be eradicated merely because we use electronics instead of um, you know me speaking right now where I'm you know moving air with my vocal cords. I mean the, that the technology has changed it does not mean that the fundamental underpinnings of liberal democracy should be destroyed. At the same time, let's come back to, to the topic, um, Angela. Um, you choose different stories. You choose a different approach and. Uh, would it be naive for you to even draw a utopia? Do you have to draw these dystopias? What, uh, uh, what do you mean exactly? By in, in that sense, is there a utopian vision that you can create knowing that all these negative, repressive and limiting things are out there? Well, I wouldn't go so far and say I can draw utopia because um, I have no idea of it. But I think that Jake was right what he said about um, we are just at the beginning of it, we are in the middle of it, it's very difficult for everybody to see the bigger picture, but it will be more and more and for me uh, the little part that I can do is to contribute to that. Uh, I would even say it's kind of a way of enlightenment maybe, I would, uh, as far as I can help to that, to Aufklärung in, in this way, I'm, I'm trying hard. and. And I don't find that people are um, 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 not approachable in the opposite. The, the play was always sold out, in the beginning maybe for different reasons, because of the scandal, but later uh, uh, when, when Snowden happened, um, it changed also the status of Assange, just to come back to that, because uh, when I basically speak to people in the beginning, they said, like, my God, this is this madman and he's totally paranoid, you know? And he was, in the first part of my play, he exactly examines um, what what Snowden pr has proved since then, you know, and people would say, oh no, that's totally paranoid, and and I was even thinking, my God, maybe he's exaggerating total surveillance. I don't believe it, you know, but now it's proven, and people uh, see it from different eyes now. So yeah, I think we are in the, in the middle of it, and uh, to raise awareness is is a lot, I think. And, yeah. Yes. Any more questions from the audience? Over here on the left? So, the, the side note, we wrote a book called Cypherpunks. Yeah. Um, myself. It's totally pr prophetic, yeah. Yeah, so Julian Assange, Andy Malogabun here in Germany, uh, Jeremy Zimmerman in France, uh, myself. And it, we talked about all of these issues about freedom of movement, about freedom of economics, about total surveillance, censorship, and so on. Um, and we examined these issues in a two part video series which was called The World Tomorrow. It was episode seven and eight or eight and nine or something. And then there's also a book to go with it. And we just had a conversation. I mean, it's not like highbrow intellectualism. It's just four guys sitting around talking. And if you want to see four white dudes sitting around talking, it's a great book, great video. Uh, it has a lot of limitations given the format. But it, I think it is the case that we talked about this long before Snowden. And for a long time, because people didn't want to believe it, they didn't. Unfortunately, we weren't even pessimistic enough, or paranoid enough. We were, we were in fact, quite optimistic. So, um, The fact that we are all here in the room, or let's put it this way, the fact that we are in a room with you two, probably makes us the target also, somehow, somewhere, uh, which is uncomfortable, of course. Um, absolutely not comparable to the type of target that you two are, but still can you encourage us to do even more than just sitting in a room with you two, um, maybe stand up or go to a house computer club or whatever without being having too much fear. It's a question of courage and fear again. Well, there is, in fact, a program called Co-Traveler, which is where the NSA looks at cell phones near other people's cell phones to find new targets. So you're exactly right. Uh, Angela has a cell phone. You, do you have a cell phone? You have a cell phone. So you're now in the social graph together, and sure enough, if you were to meet with Angela more often, you would probably be more interesting. There's like a, a weight, a metric that's assigned, it seems. And so you're right about that. So what is there to be done about that? And I actually don't have a positive answer for you. Right? I mean, the, the history of previous authoritarian systems is that they collapse under their own weight or they're overthrown. And usually the third answer is less happy, it continues, right? And so I don't think this one will collapse under its own weight because it scales magically. No one in this room has to be an agent of the NSA. The NSA must merely change your telephone's behavior to make you the equivalent of an agent. So how do we cause a system like that that violates our civil liberties to collapse? And I think the answer is that you can't easily. 
I don't know how you would do that. I don't have an answer about that. And when more oppressive regimes than the NSA, that is unless you're a Yemeni drone victim, um, when more oppressive enemy has the same idea, when they decide to do that, I'm not really clear on what the answer to that is either. So I don't, I don't actually have anything positive to tell you. I think you're fucked, actually. I think we're all fucked. And I think the only positive thing that I can say is that I am a person of Jewish descent that now lives in Berlin because I felt less free in America as a US citizen. I felt better as a person working, you know, as a freelance journalist here in Germany than in my own country. That's weird. But the fact that I can be here as a person of Jewish descent tells me that no matter how bad things get, on a long enough time frame, it's possible to turn it around. But I just don't know what the answer is to turn that around. Some things like crypto, they might help. But fundamentally, I, I mean, like I said, a full court press. But what happens when the majority of the people around you think the right answer is for you to not have civil liberties? Think the right answer is for you to be a victim of a drone strike? Think the right answer is that people should break into your apartment and plant a bug? I mean, that's the problem with democracy, actually. It's not the full solution in itself. So you've got a perspective, and I hope that you will not let the fear get to you, and you will come up with something that I could never dream of. And hopefully everyone here does that, and hopefully as artists especially, that's expressed in a way that engages other people and helps those people to do the same. And that's what we really, I think that's what we need to do to begin to understand the problem and to begin to explore possible solutions. Yes, and also I'm actually waiting for someone to come up with a startup for pigeon, male pigeons. It would be a nice idea, you know. Yeah. These guys are quite fit, I mean, maybe. Are there any further questions? So, uh, what's the first step we take when we go home? I have a cell phone here. I have a business that runs with the internet, and um, what do we do as a first step? Because we hear a lot of interesting things here, and um, I'm also a little bit older than the rest, so I'm not so technically versatile. So what do I do as a first step? Well, if you wanted to, um, I would encourage you to visit the piratebay.org and download a copy of Cypherpunks. If you want to, it's, you can also buy the book, but it's the internet, so just download it. <laughs> um, I don't make any money from the book anyway, and even if I did, I'd still encourage you to download it. So it's called um, Cypherpunks. 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 If you want to read it, it's interesting. But it will introduce you to some technologies. Technologies like Tor, which is an anonymity network, off-the-record messaging, which allows you to encrypt your instant messaging traffic, PGP, which allows you to encrypt email. To learn about these issues, I think, is the first step. But another thing is to recognize that when someone gives you the choice of subverting your communication systems and uses fear <coughs> politics, like the fear of terrorism, the fear of money laundering, the war on drugs, or child pornography, you should say, no, I don't want to sabotage my systems. I want to be able to have secure communications. And that is a useful thing to do, but that starts with yourself. So examine your own world. Think about how these things have gone badly for you, like your internet business if it's possible for your customers to communicate with you where you actually have the same level of privacy as if they walked in to a shop. But to do that, you really need to examine how this technology does impact your life. And to do that, you have to raise your consciousness about that technology. I think that that's useful. You can also do stuff like install apps on your cell phone or something like that. But security is really a process. Privacy is a process. Liberty is a process, actually. And so you can't just install an app and be done with it. Right. So, but nonetheless, you can install stuff like TechSecure, or Red Phone, or Private GSM, or, or things like along those lines, so that you can start to have some privacy, integrity, and confidentiality in your communications. But there's a lot of there's a lot to be done for your life that I don't know about because I don't know what you're doing. So you have to make that choice yourself. And a big thing would be to raise your consciousness about it. I think. Further questions? Thanks. Thank you very much for being here. I have a very short question. If our personal data is the oil of the new century, of the 21st century, why aren't we millionaires? Is there a technical way to sell our data rather than having all those big industries in the Silicon Valley milking it away and using it themselves? 
see me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> the guy in the front row says, see me afterwards. Um, you know, I, I, I once asked a CSU person this question. I went to the CSU Dominite um, Gotching. Uh, um, which, by the way, if you've never been to the Gauching CSU Ladies' Night, I highly recommend it. It's uh, really something. And I asked the guys, you know, given all this NSA spying, why are you data socialists? I thought you were the agrarian, proprietarian German political party. Why do you give away the German people's data for free? And he said, Weil wir haben die zweite Weltkrieg verloren. Which I thought was a really interesting answer. So the reason that you're not a millionaire, according to this CSU politician, was that you lost the Second World War. Now, that's the official CSU German uh, political line, but I think the other reason is because if you were actually given a choice about it, you wouldn't allow someone to extract that value from your life. That's, that's a big part of it. And the fact that you don't know that it's happening is part of the reason that you're not uh, given a choice about it. And if you were given the choice, you might not choose to sell some of these things. But if you wanted to find a way to monetize it, to regulate a market and then to sell it, I'm sure that you could do that with something inventive. But, you know, you'd have to be an entrepreneur to build that. I would never opt into your system, probably, but I think you should work on building it if you want to, so that the invisible hand of the market can strangle your shitty idea. But, <laughs> Another question, please. <laughs> are, are, we, are we done? I think I would love to have um, a last question to both of you. Are you still optimistic? <laughs> Not me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Can technology help us, or are we just fucked with technology through the whole process I, you saw? In it? I think in both of it, it's it's true. You know, I mean, it's a very difficult question. I I would say I'm a pessimistic optimist to say so. But um, on the other hand, yeah, I I do believe that there are many ways and. Um, I force myself to be optimistic because what sh should we do else, right? And uh, but uh, yeah, I, I yeah, it's it's very difficult to thoroughly answer to that. I was saying so. Well, I have friends that have died in the struggle and who are imprisoned. My friend Aaron Schwartz killed himself because of an overzealous prosecution, where they basically attacked him for downloading files. Um, that he basically had the right to download, actually, and that in any case they were paid for by the institutions that he was associated with, and they wanted to do that to him because of his politics. Right? They specifically wanted to do that because of his politics. And people like Julian Assange are much the same. And I don't have a lot of hope for Aaron Schwartz because he's dead forever, for example. <coughs> That's the reality. I mean, when I was at my friend's New Year's party, uh, we had a toast and I said, hey, we made it to 2014. And a good friend of mine, Roger, he says, well, actually, not all of us did. And so for some people, I have no hope because they are gone and we have disgraced their memory by continuing to let them not only be gone, but to continue that with the prosecution of people like Bear Brown or to deal with people like Basel, um, who's stuck in a Syrian jail where he's not an important enough political prisoner, basically, to have someone negotiate about that. So I, I don't have a lot of hope for some people, actually. I think that Laura, Glenn, and I maybe will get out of this situation alive, but probably not, actually. And, and, and we'll see. Um, but I don't have a lot of hope for myself. But I do have a lot of hope for each of you making a choice that tells us where our societies will go in the future. Um, I have a lot of hope about that, because I think that you'll make the choice, regardless of whether or not you're conscious of it. And human society will continue on. It'll be fine, I'm sure, for whoever's left around. But I don't expect that myself and some of my friends will be free. I think I'm one of the last people that is involved with some of these things that is still able to walk around free. <coughs> Julian is an example. I mean, like, look at most of the WikiLeaks, original WikiLeaks people. They either walked away or they have been put in serious harm's way or something terrible has happened to them. Or they've had to break with it in a very serious public way to sort of gain back some safety and legitimacy as far as the state is concerned. So, I mean, that to me, that means that I think I'm an optimist, um, despite all the things that I said that sound very sad, um, because I do think we still have some ability to change these things. And when I look at this in terms of mass surveillance, I think that there's obviously a lot that we can do. 
We even know what to do. We understand mathematical problems that are hard that change the fundamental economics of accessing certain fiber optic cables. We understand that stuff. So we know what can be done. And that, that gives me some hope. And there are still democratic structures that are, that are working. You know, Germany's democracy is so much better than the US, I think, in how you can meet a member of parliament and talk to them about your ideas. I tried for four years to reach out to my congressperson, and they wouldn't have a meeting with me. Right? So I mean, I, I tend to think it's not equal in how sort of deteriorated it has, has become. So that also makes me an optimist. And I think that if we're lucky, we can turn some of these things around. And I think we will, actually. But Julian will probably die in Ecuadorian embassy. Snowden will probably die in exile in Russia. And, uh, and that's the current situation. I mean, people in my country have actually said that both of them should be assassinated. Right? right now, we really do live in a world in which elected politicians openly talk about murdering their political enemies, and they say it as a matter of pride and nationalism. And they are not laughed out of their office. They're not arrested for inciting violence. So I mean, it's a serious thing. But lucky for us, they're not doing that to all of you yet. So maybe you can make sure that world doesn't come around. They were yet. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, and I think the only thing that we can do on that point is uh, rising awareness. And I thank you both to be here to do that with us. Angela and Jacob, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And let me uh, use that opportunity before uh, we all have a drink and uh, socialize and exchange ideas and get to know each other in our uh, lives. This was the first D-Day event. The next D-Day event will look at the Internet of Things, which, um, considering today's uh, topic, will be interesting to look into everyday life objects that uh, collect and transmit data and uh, what they do with it. So we look forward to seeing all of you. Uh, one thing Edward Snowden said was uh, the worst thing that can happen that nothing is happening. So we all agree and uh, we need to do something about that. So again, thank you for being here, sharing with us, and let's all have a drink. Thank Thanks. you.